<laughs> okay, so uh, this, we're going to talk about wind. Wind is basically air moving from point A to point B. <laughs> That's wind, right? Wind can have good things and bad things about it. So wind can help us power motion of our ships, but wind can also be um, a, a destructive force, obviously. What's that? That's true. We needed to sail the ocean blue to get from Spain. That's very true. So we're talking about wind. And it's good, you know, I think about this class. I think I'm going to make a little more light with this. Those are not dim slides. Um, help keep us awake, right? Um, I like how this class is set up because I think it was important that we talked about what's in the atmosphere, okay? And I think it was important that we talked about the, the liquid cycle, hydrological cycle, okay? It's all important. Now we need to talk about wind. So in order to talk about wind, we're going to revisit something we've already talked about, you know, pressure. Okay, you said as you climb a mountain, the air gets thinner, okay? It's less pressure up at, at the top of the mountain than there is down here. The gas particles are less dense up there. There's more holes between the gas particles. Down here, they're packed together, higher pressure. Okay, so um, in general, when we're walking around here, in terms of pounds per square inch, have you ever heard when you put air in your tire, it's PSI, pounds per square inch? That's pounds per inches squared, pounds per square inch. So we're bumping up against gas particles, mostly nitrogen and some oxygen, that are about 14 PSI. Well, I should say 15 PSI, 14.7 PSI. But pounds per square inch are not the units of choice when we talk about pressure, air pressure. So the units we're going to be talking about more are here. Okay. So they're all the same thing. What is pressure? Basically, gas is banging around, okay, banging against us at 14 pounds per square inch. Um, millibars, actually, I think I talked about millibars, little MBs, when I kind of drew, or when we looked at some weather maps before and those contour lines that, talk, that connected locations with the same pressure, those were in millibars. So if you want to put weather maps next to this millibar, you can, because that's usually what it's used for. Boy, it's just everything slow tonight. I've never seen this. Okay, so here, this is what we use for weather maps. This is PSI, that's your tires. <laughs> okay, um, if you've been doing your weather log, you've been recording the pressure in, um, I'll, get, I'll put internet here. In the internet, they, oh, it's not. In the internet, it's always in in terms of yeah, like in the internet, it's always in terms of inches, and that's usually I'll talk I'll show you this gizmo. What do you mean by inches of of, of pressure? I'll talk about what that is. Actually, it's the element mercury. Okay. It expands as pressure rises. Yes. Um, it rises as basically pressure increases, and it kind of shoves it up its tube. Mm -hmm. Okay, so PSI is, is this the LB slash IN inches squared, pounds per square inch. But these are all different ways to talk about the pressure of the atmosphere. Okay. Pressure of the atmosphere. And we're going to see, honestly, that, that if, if you want to talk about wind that's blowing, like we saw the wind is blowing and the wind blows hard, the wind blows soft, it's all about pressure. The wind is actually created by a high pressure and a low pressure air wants to move from a high to a low. So this little bit about pressure is important to talk about wind. So let's see if this will, yeah. So actually, I just today changed my, uh, this hot link to, instead of AccuWeather, to go to Weather Underground. Oh, goodness. It is totally one of those days. So let's look at what the pressure is. Well, let's not. Anybody got their 
their weather information pulled up? What's the pressure in inches? Oh, I can in a second. Thanks. Might be faster. <laughs> I have the Weather Underground app open. I'm blurring it. <clears throat> the pressure is 30.57 inches. Thir thank you, 30.57 inches. That's the current pressure. And notice they don't say inches of mercury, but that's what it is. All right. Now it's really mad. Okay, next slide, please. Please. Okay, so there's those different scales of pressure. So I like this slide because it kind of puts things into perspective about the different scales. Ooh, what's that? Oh, now it's bringing up my wonderground. Well, I don't want it now. <laughs> oh, goodness. Let's see. All right. So um, that actually that gray stuff is actually supposed to be liquid mercury, so that's kind of like how that's showing you. So on the high scale, so you said our current pressure was 30 point what? 30.57. That's pretty high. 30.57 inches of mercury, you know. So in this chapter and in, in actually in, in this whole unit, we're going to talk about severe pressure, like severe high pressure, severe low pressure. Things with high pressure, like um, the highest pressure ever recorded at this elevation or sea level um, is 1,084 millibars or 32, um, about 32 inches, okay? Those H's on a weather map, this is going to get exciting, I think, okay? So um, you guys told me before that we can, on a weather map, we see blue lines, those represent cold fronts. We see red lines, they represent uh, warm fronts. You see H's, they represent high pressure. The L's on the weather map represent low pressure, okay? So in general, um, like you saw on the previous slide, we are at about uh, um, 1,013 millibars. So actually, that is a number sometimes that makes it to my test. 1,013 millibars is in general what the atmospheric pressure is. That corresponds to something less than today's pressure um, in the inches of mercury, that's 29.92. But the interesting or scary weather actually is associated with low pressures. Um, in this unit of material, we're going to talk about a weather storm system that's called a mid-latitude cyclone. And mid-latitude cyclones, depending upon the time of year, can bring all sorts of things like tornadoes and snowstorms. <laughs> okay, mid-latitude cyclones. Um, and the L's, they come across the weather map with a big old L. So this is kind of the central low pressure you're looking at. Hurricanes, we're actually going to talk about in this chapter too, I think. I can't remember. Maybe that's in I mean, not this chapter in this unit. I can't remember if it's unit four or unit three. But hurricanes have a big old L, okay, associated with their middle, with their eye. Okay, the, lo the lower, the low in the eye of a hurricane, the crazier the storm, because the crazier the winds. Um, so pressure actually is important to talk about before we talk about winds. I have a question that has to do with weather and hurricanes, and it just made me think of it. Okay. Why can planes fly through hurricanes, but not fly through thunderstorms? Um, well, the thing about hurricanes is actually they oftentimes are described as having thunderstorms or cumulonimbus clouds kind of embedded in their eye wall and also in their spiral rain bands. So a plane that is flying interacting with a hurricane is most likely interacting with um, storm cells, too. I would say that those planes, maybe this answers your question, those planes that track, because they do give some very good information about hurricanes, those are designed to do so. And no, commercial planes fly through hurricanes all the time. Really? They, they purposefully avoid um, hmm. thunderstorms. I don't know. Maybe don't it's know. because it has some you sure commercial planes fly through hurricanes all the time? I saw a video of the other day. <laughs> I 
Oh. It was really cool. I don't know. I don't know. I have to. I'll have to think if I can think like, of something. Like the video, they like flew straight into the eye of the hurricane and then straight through the eye of the hurricane back into. The, it was really cool. Did they take a vote before they did that? <laughs> I mean, like. Yeah. I, I guess it's commonplace. I don't know. I'll have to look into that. Um, so pressure is a player in, in creating winds. We need to visit the whole pressure thing and, and, and look at the pressure that's on a weather map to understand what the winds are going to be, basically. So um, I brought back in my aneroid barometer. So there's two, there's a couple, there's more than just these two devices that can measure the pressure of the atmosphere. But this, is, this one is actually the second one, the aneroid barometer. The first one is the whole inches of mercury one. And so I have a figure from your textbook that shows you how do we get inches, how do we get pressure to translate into inches of mercury. And here's how it works. Basically, there's a glass tube that's closed at the top, okay, and open down here, and there's a pan of open mercury here. Mercury barometers are messy. You would not want to take these up in an airplane no, to understand what the pressure of your cabin is or that sort of thing. So, what it counts on is basically the, press, the gas particles okay, that's creating the pressure of interest actually pushing a pressure on this open liquid of mercury here. And depending upon that pressure, it will, if this increases actually, like I said, it will go up, it will give you more inches of mercury. If this lessens, the liquid, in the, the liquid mercury in the column will drop if that gets less. So that'd be less inches of mercury. So that's how that works. Okay, so usually when you look at the internet, they will tell you the pressure in inches. Um, and um, in physical science, if we, if we want to use the whole uh, mercury barometer thing, we don't use inches because we're stuck on whole metric system. So instead of inches of mercury, you'll see it as millimeters of mercury. Then you have to use one inch is exactly well, 2.54 centimeters and do the conversion. Okay, so that's a mercury barometer, one way to measure pressure. And so this is the barometer, and I'll go ahead and pass this around. Um, this is an aneroid barometer. Aneroid meaning, I think, without air. But basically, there is um, this box, when it comes around, if you want to, just gently, I trust all you guys. I've had some monsters just kind of squeeze it. But if you just kind of gently squeeze this, okay, you're going to see actually the black needle is going to move. So the black needle actually is sensing the pressure. And this gold needle, this is for the user to, to operate. So this gold needle is to go ahead and set it on what it is now. And then you can come back a day later and look to see if the black one moved relative to what your gold one is. So the gold one is supposed to be settable by you. And one of the things, um, and this chapter reinforces it, is that um, if you have one of those, oftentimes it will have on its dial its segments of low pressure, very low pressure stormy, moderately low pressure rain, um, uh, normal pressure change, um, high pressure fair, very high pressure, very high dry, very dry. Okay, so this is high pressure, and this is this is very high pressure. This is very low pressure. So a lot of times those those words are already on your aneroid barometer. Okay, so in general, high pressures bring clear skies, low pressures bring stormy skies, or cloudy skies if not precipitation, low pressure. So that's one of the things we'll probably do a little more looking at the weather maps and see if when we look for the L on the weather map, is that indeed cloudy, okay? When we look for the high, the H, the high, that's what H means on the weather map, is it clear skies, okay? The other thing in, on your weather log, you guys have been recording that what's called the tendency, and that's what that little gold bar is there for. So you set the gold bar and you come back to see if it, if it fell or, yeah, if it, if it rose or if it fell, okay? And that would be your tendency. Is your pressure rising or is your pressure falling or is your pressure steady? That's, that's really one of the things you're recording on your weather log, okay? Um, so, all right. So here's the deal. We all know if you go to Mile High Stadium, right, Denver, that um, you can hit a home run easier. More easily? Okay. The air's thinner up there? Okay. So here's the deal. If I take an aneroid barometer up there, of course it's going to be less. Okay. 
But in order to understand what's going on, um, we actually kind of need to correct for elevation. Um, so this is what they do. When we look at the weather map and they say Mile High Stadium has a barometric pressure of 1,000 millibars or 1,013 or 1,008 millibars, they act actually correct it for its elevation. They've added on a chunk because it's so hot. Here's how this works. I have two slides to kind of explain it. This has three locations. One location is at sea level. Okay, so it's at sea level. So what the barometer says is what they report. No need to correct for elevation. Well, the next station is up a little bit. Notice that it's 1,000 meters above sea level. So the barometer reads 915 millibars. Better not go reporting that because part of that's kind of an artificial low pressure because you're going up in elevation. So what they have to do is add on 99 millibars for the elevation they climb. Now I'm not going to make you do any of these calculations just to kind of know that what you'll see on the weather map is 1014 millibars. Which actually, can you see where it's a higher pressure, higher corrected pressure than station A. Okay. Um, Station C, okay, notice it's even higher elevation. The amount they had to add on to their 840 millibars is 180 millibars. Okay, so they would report 1,020 millibars. It's correcting for elevation. So these down here, in other words, are the values that you would see on the weather map. These would be are reported. So this is a similar figure, um, but it just has one station. Notice here at sea level, there's no correction required. And again here, that's a location 1,600 meters above sea level. You had to add 172 millibars. To me, you'd have to look that up in a table or something to know how much to add. OK. So. The air gets thinner when you go climb a mountain. <laughs> Seems like I've said this for every unit in here. So this is the third unit. Okay. So here we have kind of a, some isolated air, and that piston is movable, and kind of look to see what the pressure does. So if we add a weight on that movable piston, basically it's, we, it, air is compressible, gas is compressible, and um, it's a more density, and the pressure increases put another weight on it and the pressure increases even more. It's more dense. You can see it's a bluer color. Okay, the pressure increases even more. Okay, so uh, with increasing pressure, we have increasing density. All right, so notice the title of these columns. There's three columns up here. We have height above the ground. Okay, this would be at sea level. This is 0.5 kilometers. This is one kilometers, one and a half kilometers, two kilometers, okay, above the ground. Okay, we know the pressure should decrease. We see the pressure decreasing. And that last column is showing you how it's cooling. Okay, so it's getting cooler and cooler and cooler as you go up in elevation. Okay, so notice that um, we continue to go up in elevation. That middle column, again, pressure decreases. Air gets thinner as you go up in elevation. Um, here, the reason I have the brakes, see what happens after the negative 43, negative 50, negative 56, negative 56. Um, right about here, I guess I should have said, should have drawn my line up here. What's happening to temperature between on the underneath that red line and on top of that red line? See how the temperature is getting warmer? <clears throat> so actually, this is where we have reached the tropopause. All right. So differences in pressure. Now, one of the things you're going to want to make sure we all know is the difference between um, 
the horizon ho or horizontal versus vertical, okay? So if we have horizontally a difference in pressure, okay, we can go ahead and create wind. And I'll show you how that works. But how do you get this a different pressure than this? And I'm going to show you three different ways. And so you're going to want to know these. Um, one is the temperature difference. Um, warm air tends to be fluffier. Okay, to me that, that should get you down the road to, to remembering that. Warm air is less dense, it's fluffy. And so warm air in general will be a low pressure. Cold air is more dense and it will generally be a high pressure. Okay, so already if you have a and we're going to talk about um, a breeze here in a minute called a lake breeze or a sea breeze. And opposite would be a land breeze. And that actually is a difference in temperatures. So think hot or warm, low pressure, cold or cool, a high pressure. Okay, the other thing, now this is kind of counterintuitive. You know, the things that are kind of backwards from what you think. If it's a muggy day, you're like, oh my gosh, the air feels so thick. And it does feel so thick. It's hard to breathe when it's a muggy, high water vapor day. But here's the deal. That moist air actually is a lower pressure. I know it feels thick. Okay? And that's actually going to be a player. If you have a chunk of air over here that is, has wild, high water content, actually that's a low pressure. Dry air will have a high pressure. And the reason is, shown down there, down there, oops, the fact that water actually weighs less than, it's lighter than nitrogen or oxygen. So moist air, low, dry air, high. We'll revisit that later. One more thing. And you, remember we said that one of the lifting mechanisms you guys hopefully told me on your test successfully at some point is convergence, okay? So convergence basically is where you throw candy in the middle of the room and everybody goes to get the candy. Okay, we all meet up at one spot, okay? Um, so actually, if you think of that scenario with the whole candy, we have created a high pressure right there. High pressure, right? Where they were coming from, a low pressure. So basically, the point of convergence will create high pressure, okay? The, uh, the other thing, oh, I know what I usually use. I usually say somebody like passed gas or something. At that point, basically, instead of being like candy, everybody's going to diverge from that area, okay? And that creates a low pressure. So convergence is high, divergence is low. All right. So back in unit... One, we talked about isoplasts are basically contour lines that connect locations that have the same something. We said isotherms connect the same temperature. Well, we need to switch gears now and have another contour map that connects locations with the same pressure, and those are called isobars. So let's see if these, how these links work. Isobars. Connecting locations with the same pressure. Well, that's incorrect. It is trying real hard. <clears throat> so this is in telecast. I, I like their weather maps. I think it's whatever you're used to, probably. So... They're kind of hard to see. Let's see. Let's see if it. No, it's not going to get any bigger. I think I can use my mouse. So you see the 1032, that's millibars. Oh, really? I'm going to dim the lights. 
So we're looking for these isobars. So there you can see with between Minneapolis or Minneapolis basically is lying on a line there, 1032. That is, oh, and I think I'll be able to draw around it maybe. The, that is, all those locations on that line have a pressure of 1,032 millibars. So this is 1,032 millibars. You see that contour line? Let's see, um, 32, wow, that's 24. We have some big jumps there. The next contour line out I see is this one, which is 8. A unit of eight. That's quite a bit. I'm going to choose a different color. Let's choose purple. So this purple line is actually outlining all locations that have a barometric pressure of 1032. Okay. So those are contour lines. Nope. Stop drawing. All right, finally. So now let's link up pressure with wind. I've already kind of alluded to this idea that basically what wind is moving, and actually it's moving from a high to a low. That is actually an important thing. Okay. So this is a high pressure, and it kind of makes sense. I'll put the letter H here, and I'll put like these little dots that are squished together, okay? And I'll put an L over here, and I'll put these little dots that are not so squished together. So can you see where that, where there's a bunch of air, will just generally go to the low pressure, okay? That arrow is actually moving air, and that is wind, moving from a high to a low pressure. That's it. I've got some examples. Um, so, for instance, this turkey baster thing, like if I squeeze the bulb, basically what I'm doing is, when I, before I squeeze it, is this a word? I'm not scared. Before I squeeze it, it has this normal pressure, but if I squeeze it like this, I'm making it smaller, I'm creating a high pressure in there, and that's a high and that's a low, and I've got basically air on the move we call wind, okay? A simpler thing, you know, we said that the collector droplet, the large collector droplet has a hard time getting the little baby droplets because basically as it falls through, it creates that high pressure underneath. If I take this and go up and down, okay, basically as I move up, I'm creating a high pressure here. There's normal pressure here, so basically air is going to relocate up. That's our wind. That's our thing that cools us off, okay? So, I mean, it's a very common, common thing. So in this chapter, we need to talk about once wind is created because it's air going from a high to a low pressure, okay, it doesn't always go in a straight line. So we're actually going to talk about um, these two things, the Coriolis force and the frictional force that actually makes it go, makes it go not in a straight line. Um, all right, we've already recently looked at weather maps. We're not going to do that again. Okay. But I'm going to show you something on the next slide that kind of looks like a football field. Okay. It kind of looks like you start at this end and you're trying to get down to that end. So basically we have high pressure and a low pressure down there. So when you have these, these isobars kind of spacing, kind of marking off, different pressures, okay? If these isobars are close together, we call that a tight spacing, we call that a tight gradient, a steep gradient, excuse me. If the isobars are really close together, we call that a steep pressure gradient, and that means that if you move just a little bit, you're gonna get a big change in pressure. The bigger the change in the pressure between your high and the low, the stronger your wind, that's it. Where if you have a big jump, I mean, you have to go way far in order to get just a normal change in your pressure, then you can have wind, but it's not going to be very, very strong. Okay, so the more tightly spaced the isobars, 
the, um, the stronger the wind. By the way, then, the tight space or the not tight space, we call that the pressure gradient in general. All right, so here's my football field. We have high pressure and low pressure. So notice that in, in increments of four, four millibars, so we have 1,016 millibars, 1,012 millibars. I bet the next one's going to be 1,008 millibars, 1,004 millibars, etc. This would be kind of a normal spacing. So basically, you would have air relocating, but it wouldn't be a strong wind. Okay. If we compare kind of this weak pressure gradient with this sort of strong pressure gradient over here, notice each step is still four millibars, but they're close together. So you don't have to go very far before you have a, a four millibar change, which is a lot. Okay, so this would actually would be a strong wind. This would be a weak wind over here. All right, so I don't know. I wasn't impressed with IntelliCast's weather map that they gave us. I'll have to see if I can find a better ongoing map for isobars. These isobars are more pronounced. This is what I was trying to show you a minute ago. Um, so here's a figure from, um, from your textbook. So, um, for instance, everything, it looks like a bullseye. Does it look like a bullseye? Oftentimes they do. A lot of times um, in the center of the bullseye, you'll either find an L or an H, meaning a central low for the L or a central high for the H. The lows are notorious for having these tight isobars, which, according to the last slide, means strong winds. Okay. Um, so the way you read this map is, I think we did one of these before, the little thingies, um, the little, they're little flags. So the more flags means the stronger wind. So you could, you could go here and you'd see that there's a, that looks like it corresponds to this, which would be 61 to 66 miles per hour. Okay. So that's how that works. So this would be um, a steep pressure gradient. I'll just put gradient. And this would be a weak pressure gradient, or weaker anyway. So this is an updated figure from your textbook. It's very similar. Um, I think the text on the bottom of this is different. So it just simply says with the central low, we are seeing tighter or tighter spacing of our isobars, and that's bringing us stronger winds. All right. So in I get my chapters mixed up, but in this unit, in unit three. We're going to talk about an assortment of winds that have names. Have you ever heard of the Santa Ana winds? Okay, that's one of the winds that we're going to talk about. Um, have you ever heard of lake breezes associated with Lake Michigan it's off Ch in Chicago, up the lake? Okay. It's like a, I don't know, I think what they call it is just a local wind, a local interesting wind, a local strong wind sometimes. Okay. So the thing about all of these little kind of localized winds is the name in front of the wind, word wind or breeze, in this case the word sea, okay, says where it's coming from. So sea breezes are coming from the sea, lake breezes are coming from the lake. All right, so sea breezes, let's look at how they occur. And like I said, lake breezes occur the same reason for, as sea breezes occur. In order for this to make sense, you need to go back in unit one where we talked about your swimming pools large bodies of water, oceans, I guess oceans, larger body of water than a swimming pool, hopefully, okay, they tend to heat up really slowly and cool down really slowly. So they retain their heat, but it takes them a while to heat up. Land on the other side, yeah, they'll kind of respond to the sun heating them up or nighttime them cooling down. So um, that's actually what's the crux of creating these lake breezes that can be really strong. Um, or these sea breezes, it's the same thing. So I'm going to use this picture, I think, to kind of 
talk me through this text. But whether it's a lake breeze or a sea breeze, they peak about 3 p.m. The problem with Chicago, and you probably heard this, is basically they get all this wind coming off of Lake Michigan, and they have those tall skyscrapers, and basically that wind just kind of channels <laughs> through the, tries to find its little holes, and it's just, it's crazy. I think what they call that, um, um, it's like a tunnel wind. Very strong. Okay. So here we have no sun is up. You see the little moon there. And you see basically everything's nice and settled. We have kind of similar temperatures over the water as we do over the land. Okay, but now when the sun starts to come up, the thing that's going to heat up faster, fastest, is the land. Okay, so basically this is becoming nice and toasty. And a few slides ago, I said <coughs> if something is warmer, I don't know if you remember, but I said if something's warmer, basically those particles spread apart and you have a low pressure. So we're already starting to kind of create a low pressure here. Okay, and where, how, which direction does wind go? It goes from a high to a low, and that's your sea breeze. Okay, the land is going to heat up more quickly. Okay, creating. I'll go ahead and add to this down here. This low right here, and maybe it's already kind of obvious, but that low right there is because it heated quickly compared to the um, sea. Also, considering over those large bodies of water, there's nothing to stop that wind or slow it down, like trees. <laughs> yeah, but the thing that creates wind is a difference in pressure. Yeah. And then you can talk about friction, you know, yeah. So there's a low here. That's how I usually think that this that heated up quickly. Okay, and so basically it's a, a vacuum, and so it goes ahead and we have water, excuse me, air moving from a high to a low and in the form of wind. That's what wind is, okay. Now the thing about it is the air right there at that low is going to kind of build up and it's going to be, it ascends. It goes up and it creates a, a high pressure aloft. L-A-L-O-F-T, that actually is a word, just an upper elevation. Okay, so we have a low down here, a high up there. What this does actually then is kind of um, complete a cell. Okay. So that's what happens during the day. They call it a sea breeze, they call it a lake breeze because it comes from the sea, it comes from the lake. And it has to do with the fact with either Chicago or this land over here is going to heat up more quickly than your Lake Michigan or your large body of water. Okay, well, remember the word before the breeze or the word before the word wind tells you where your localized movement is coming from. So a land breeze must be coming from the land and going outward. So a land breeze, basically we have this very similar thing going. At nighttime, which thus the moon, right? Okay, at nighttime, basically your land is going to cool faster than your, your, your ocean or your lake. And if it cools, if you go back a few slides, we said that cool air has a high pressure. And so what's that going to do, basically? It's going to push, let me choose a different color, from that high to that low. Okay, basically, there is no color that works here. You're going to have a movement of air, and that actually is an outgoing breeze. So it's kind of nice. Now, if you built up a little bit of smog during the day, it's time to kind of cut loose of it. So land breezes happen at night, and that's why. So here's one for you. If you climb the mountain and the air gets thinner up there, so that's a low pressure, that's a high pressure at the bottom of the mountain, and basically we know that air wants to move from a high to a low pressure. And so you'd be like, oh my gosh. So you would think that we basically should have vertical winds everywhere all the time. There should be, because there, there is that pressure gradient difference. There is a high and there is a low, okay? So we do not have vertical wind 
everywhere. It's actually balanced by gravity. Okay, so the reason chunks of air don't, doesn't, don't want to basically go straight up from a high to a low pressure at upper elevations is because gravity. And the, the balance of gravity to this, this existing vertical pressure gradient from high to low, that's called hydrostatic equilibrium. So I've got a few uh, pictures that I think are pretty good on the next page. So now, when we talk about thunderstorms, by the way, do you remember in the last unit I talked about that gentle updraft? Vertical wind. Vertical wind. Okay. Um, but when we talk about severe weather and cumulonimbus clouds, those things that get really big, there is a lot of instability. There is... There, this vertical movement of air is a player. Okay, so it's not always balanced. All right, so here's my pictures. Okay, so this would be, this would be high pressure down here, low pressure up there. That was what I was trying to describe. So that arrow is showing you maybe the movement of air, basically. It is showing you a force that exists, what's called the pressure gradient force. Okay, and then this over here would be the force of gravity. So in physics, what they do is they use the length to show you how strong they are. So if they're both the same strength, okay, they're in what we call equilibrium. So this is just another figure to kind of show you the same thing. That parcel of air would want to go up because of high to low pressure, but it would want to come down because of gravity. And if there's no movement or if it's a net balance, that's um, hydrostatic equilibrium. Okay. So just to kind of summarize the things that we've talked about when we, you know, we talked about pressure, and then we talked about pressure differences, highs and lows. Okay, and then we talked about those pressure differences actually are what create wind. That's why air moves, because there's a high pressure where it is and a low pressure where it's going to. Okay. Um, so we're going to take a break, and after break, we're going to talk about these things. Why doesn't, why doesn't air go straight? Why isn't wind always straight? We're going to talk about these two forces on a large scale that actually um, change the direction of wind. So we'll take a... 10-ish minute break. Come back, maybe 12 minutes. So it'll be like 40, 540, right? <laughs> My 